Hello, once again, uh, welcome on my scientific blog Discover Social Sciences. And once again, a reminder that uh, if you want to read the body text of the update that goes with this video, in the description box below the video, you will find the link to my blog. So you will find the link discoversocialsciences.com. You click on that link, uh, which will transport you to the site of my blog and there you will be able to, uh, to find the body text of the update with the same title as the title of this video. So that's the general rule. So now, so it was like the usual formal introduction and now the subject matter of this update. So first of all, a warning. This update or the reading of this update is uh, for those who like really like philosophy at the frontier of mathematics. Because as you might remember, if you have been following my blog for some time, you remember that during the last few weeks I wrote a few updates about using a uh, an analytical model, an analytical method called mean reversion uh, to study stock prices and to make for myself an investment strategy for the stock market. And when I was doing that, when I was studying how that investment strategy made on the basis of mean reversion works, I discovered a strange well, maybe not so strange, but an interesting property of that method that first of all, if I make a neural network, so, so a piece of artificial intelligence based precisely on that method of mean reversion, that neural network tends to underscore systematically, so undervalue the real stock prices. It predicts lower stock prices than those that really happen in the market. And I was wondering why. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, I've discovered that when uh, the price of something, not really of stock, but for, for example, the price of some minerals in the international markets are really stationary, that method fails. Eh? If there is no visible change, that specific method fails. And I was trying to understand why, once again. I have the deep belief that mathematics represent the structure of our perception as regards reality. I am an empiricist, uh, so I believe that uh, what I really perceive is not reality, it is my perception of reality. Huh? That reality is some kind of essential basic stuff that is out there and that my mind doesn't have like direct, uh, direct access to. Hmm? Everything I think of is a representation of reality rather than reality itself. And mathematics show us like the way that our mind goes about perceiving reality and understanding our own perception of reality. And in this update, I dive like deep into what is called the Gaussian curve or the, or the Gaussian process. So I essentially try to understand the logic of the normal distribution or what is commonly called the Gaussian curve. And I like really try to, to dive into the basic logic of uh, that equation. And in order to do that, I even went back to one of the original papers written by Carl Friedrich Gauss and presented in uh, 1827. At, an, in a, at a lecture with the Royal Society, uh, precisely about the theory of curved surfaces. And I discovered, or I rediscovered, something that I heard about uh, in the past, that what Gauss was really about was not so much a theory of probability, so he wasn't so much about creating the theory of that bell curve, he was rather about the theory of measuring curved distances. So his work was very useful in astronomy, in astrophysics. His work was very useful, for, for example, in geodetics. So in surveying uh, distances in, like, in, in 
in real life on a real rugged curved surface. And I tried to understand what is the connection, what is the connection between that geometry that Gauss was so much about and uh, the, the curve that we today call the Gaussian curve, the normal distribution. I have some insights, yes, uh, or, or yet I must tell you that I am far from understanding it fully. Uh, what I have understood so far is that Carl Friedrich Gauss had that basic intuition that if we want to understand how to measure distances on a curved surface, we need to imagine our reality as a sphere, as a sphere inside of which we are. So we are sort of looking at our reality like from, from inside a spherical structure. There is some sense to it, uh, as you can read in that update of mine today. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that if I take that spherical logic of the of, of that Carl Friedrich Gauss's paper from 1827, on the one hand, and if I take the logic of the Gaussian curve today, I can sort of match them. So I can fit many, many overlapping spheres under the Gauss curve. And then there is some logic. Uh, I can say then that there is something like a sequence of local chaoses uh, that together make a structure the whole. Hmm? Why do I use the word chaos? Imagine that you are in the center of a spherical space. And imagine that all the phenomena, all the things that can happen possibly to you in, in your life, are points on the surface of that sphere. If you are in the center, all those points are equidistant from you because each of those points is at the distance of the radius of the sphere from you. And uh, if everything that can possibly happen is at the same distance from you, you have no damn idea what will happen first and what will happen next. And this is for me one of the best definitions of existential chaos. So that spherical logic of Gauss uh, corresponds to a worldview when we have something like a local chaos of our perception. And only if we stack together many such local chaotic perceptions we can have something structured. Okay, now I, I know that I have dived so deep into philosophy, into my own thinking, that you might have lost the thread of my logic. So now just relax. Go to the description box below the video. Click on the link. The link will lead you to the website of my blog and then or there, look for the update which have which has the same title as this video, and you will read more. I hope you will enjoy that intellectual walk. Bye.